Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I chair the committee responsible for these broadcasts. Today's program explores the past, present, and future of California's water crisis. Our speaker is none other than our very own Catherine Freshly. The hat she wears for her presentation today is Vice President of the Board of Directors of the El Toro Water District. Catherine has served on that board since 2018. Over that time, she has developed a keen sense of where our water comes from, how climate change has and will affect our water sources, and what we should do to make sure we don't run dry. As residents of Laguna Woods know, before Catherine joined the El Toro Water Board, she was very active in local politics, ultimately serving as president of the Golden Rain Foundation. Under her tenure, Laguna Woods moved from being a client of a large HOA management company to being a self-governing entity. Other local achievements include being a discussion leader for the Foreign Policy Association and participating actively in our golf community. Catherine has worked as an engineer, as a manager, and as a consultant for several companies, most notably GE. She holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and has pursued graduate studies in business and systems engineering. In short, Catherine is highly qualified, not only to serve on our water board, but to share her expertise with us. And so today, Concerned Citizens is delighted to welcome Catherine Freshly, who has titled her presentation, Let's Talk About Water. <laughs> Catherine, would you please share your screen with us? Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. It's my pleasure to be with you. Okay, let's see if I get, I'm trying to share the screen. Okay, well, it's really my pleasure to really uh, to, to talk and present uh, to everybody. And and as, uh, as as Suzanne mentioned, I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm top, my topic is water overall. Let's understand water. And so in doing that, I'm gonna talk initially about about the El Toro uh, Water District. I'll start with that. Then we'll talk about where does our water come from. And finally, let's talk about the drought and what its uh, impact is going to be on us. And first of all, El Toro, I want to give a little bit of background. El Toro was founded, you know, in 1960, serves close to, <clears throat> you can see the map there, uh, serves 50,000 residents in, in portions of several of the cities, has 60 employees. And what's interesting is that this, uh, the, the, the district was established by the far, by farmers in the area. They got together and they established the El Toro Water District. Uh, and, and that's why it tended to follow the farmlands. So it's, it's rather irregular. And we are, and we are bounded by, okay, and you can see, but we are bounded by to the north Irvine Ranch Water District. To the east, uh, 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 Santa Margarita Water District. To the south, we have Molten, Molten, uh, Ranch, Molten Ranch Water District or Molten Miguel Water District. And then we have Laguna Beach, which has their own water district. So we kind of sit right here in the middle and we're one of the smallest uh, districts uh, here locally. This is our, our board. We have a five member board and the board members themselves come with a, with a very 
<clears throat> excuse me, diverse background. And that's really helpful. Mike uh, basically has had worked in the water industry for quite a few years and has extensive water, whoops, extensive water, um, water, water industry experience and HR experience. And myself, uh, Suzanne already explained my background. Jose is a, as a civil engineer and reti has retired from the Metropolitan Water District. And Mark is currently is a, he's a, uh, he works in um, finance and is currently working as a financial advisor. And in Kay Havens, uh, she uh, joined us a couple of years ago and her education focused on environmental um, analysis and water quality and is certified as a master gardener uh, for sustainable lands, landscaping and an expert there. So we, that background allows us when we're talking about issues for the water district, we all come with a very different perspective, but we work well together. And I think that, you know, uh, the leadership that we're gained, that we have because of the diverse board uh, really helps the district. One of the things I want people to really understand is El Toro, although we call ourselves a water district, that's only half of our business, okay? We have the potable water, you know, that, uh, that we're delivering to everybody. We got 170 miles of water pipeline, eight water pump stations. You know, we operate our own state certified uh, laboratory to ensure that we have, uh, that, uh, uh, that we're maintaining a water quality. We run about 12,000 water tests a year. And, 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 and those tests, the results are filed with the state. And we have six storage, uh, storage reservoirs. And believe it or not, when you really get down underground and you don't see it, we've got over 5,000 valves that have to be maintained, 2,000 fire hydrants that uh, have, uh, we have responsibility for, 10,000 water meters, and a whole lot of connections. So the infrastructure, and this is one of the points that I often have made is that what people don't see in the utilities is so critical and it's a good part of the major investment in the, in, in, in the facility. And for example, our reservoir, this is the largest reservoir in South Orange County. We share its capacity with uh, with Santa Margarita Water District and Moulton Niguel Water District. It's a 275 million gallon reservoir. It's lined and it's covered. It's about 30 years old and it's the largest uh, count, uh, covered reservoir in Orange County. And right now we're in the process of considering uh, a project that we have to go forward with for this, uh, for this reservoir because we've run some tests on it and, uh, and it's made of a, a special plastic material. And so it's going to cost us to, to, re, to, to redo this reservoir about, about $20 million. Half of that will be El Toro and the other half will be paid by the other water districts. And it's, it's gonna take us nine months of construction. So I'll show you later on where the, where the water for this reservoir comes from, and it comes directly here. That's all drinkable water. That's why it's covered. That's why it's lined, so that it's, it's water that's ready to be delivered to our customers. Okay. Now, the other part of our business is the, uh, is the wastewater. You know, we got to bring you the water, and then we're going to take it away. And so, the wastewater collection, you know, we maintain 158 miles of, of uh, sewers and, and 11 sewer pump stations. And as you know, the, the sewers, the wastewater is heavily regulated. And so we can be fined if we aren't keeping our pipes clean. We're not allowed, we're making sure that we don't end up with any sewer spills. Part of what we have, and you'll see the lower picture over here, down here, which is uh, our recycling plant. Now this is a 6 million gallons a day recycling plant. And this plant, actually, you'll see where it is. This is the RV parking center right here. Right here is the golf course, okay? 
Uh, you can see the towers right up here, okay? This was originally built, the original plant was located there by Cortese when he developed the community. In fact, the golf course has always been watered with recycled water. So that was, you know, Cortese built this in about 1963 originally, and in its output, all of its water went to the golf course. <clears throat> We had a, we put in about a $12 million investment to bring in tertiary water treatment, which cleaned it up and made it suitable then to be able to distribute it elsewhere, you know, to use it other than a golf course, you know, use it around houses and use it for our sprinkler system. And as, as I'll talk a little bit later, you know, most of 80% of the water from this plant, the recycled water, goes to the village. And we maintain then 25 miles of the recycled water pipes, which, uh, which, you know, which you can see here are the construction we were putting in. And it has reduced our potable water demand then by 400 million gallons. And that's one of the ways that all of the, uh, you know, all of the water districts in Southern California, we have done a great job of using recycled water for irrigation. Elsewhere in the state, that hasn't happened. That's one of the problems that uh, the Northern California has. Okay, and it you know and 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 for us, since we don't have an aquifer, you see, we don't. A lot of water districts have an aquifer. See, Irvine Ranch has an aquifer that they draw from uh, under Orange County. Orange County has a huge aquifer. In fact, many of the water districts there in in Orange County. Uh, you know, like Yorba Linda and Anaheim and Santa Ana, they just pump the water out of the aquifer. They don't have to worry about it. Now, the orange, you know, the Orange County uh, uh, Sewer District and the Orange County Water District, they are in the process and they are totally recycling their water and they're getting up to 150 million gallons a day of having potable water. And right now that's put back into the Orange County aquifer. So Northern Orange County is in a very different situation than we are in Southern Orange County. And unfortunately, we don't have that water available to us. Although we've had some discussions if we ever had a serious uh, drought where we couldn't get our fresh water, uh, we'd manage to get it from, from that aquifer and, and through MODOC. So now let me move on to the, to the so where, where does our water come from? And that's an interesting part. Most people don't realize that where we're moving our water from. And you'll see on this map up here, you know, you start out at Lake, there's Lake Shasta up here, uh, Lake Oroville, and then you got the State Water Project, which comes in just south of the bay. Here's, here's, the, here's the, 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 the Delta, the Bay Delta. And then at this point, we get to start with the state water project and it moves down. And so we have transfer and storage. This area is where uh, water is pulled off to supply other agencies. Here, here's a line going down the Santa Barbara area. Then we have the LA aquifer, the Los Angeles aquifer. And if you remember how that came from the Owens Valley, remember those, the story, there was a movie about that, okay? That's the LA aquifer that was brought down. It was, it was a result of the LA aquifer that even allowed Los Angeles to even grow because it didn't have water. There wasn't a lot of water. And then we also then, we have this aqua, then, and so the, so the state water project brings the aqueduct all the way to this point, which is uh, where the Deemer plant is, and I'll talk about that. And then we have the Colorado River aqueduct, which pulls the water from the Parker Dam across and brings about, it's about 230 miles, we're bringing the water here. So, and uh, the other point I wanna make here is that there is aquifer under LA, there is the aquifer under Orange County, and so there are aquifers here, but it's not sufficient to supply potable water to all the people who live here. So what have we done? Okay, we've used conservation, and we talked about the recycling basically for irrigation. So let's move on and you'll see this. And, and let's talk about the state water project now. 
And uh, right here, this here is actually Oroville Dam, the way it was before we had the last rainstorm. So you can see how empty it is. And the largest state, the, you know, the state water product is the largest state built power system in the nation. You know, the water and power is comes 600 miles down to us, brings the water to 25 million people here and 750 million acres of farmland relies on this on this water uh, coming from the north. Lake Il Orville is the main capacity with 375 million acres and supplies that water flow supplies three hydroelectric power plants. And so we're generating electricity all the time that we're moving that water. And it's important that we do. Moving water takes a lot of electricity. 40% of the state's electrical use is used to move water and, and, and to move water in the sewers. And that's, you know, for most people, that's an astounding number that, you know, we couldn't live without the electricity moving the water for us. And that's a, a key element. Now, we have a storage system, the major reservoirs across the state to capture and to furnish the water as carried by the state water project. There are 12 different reservoirs shown here. And the chart for the reservoir is, 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 is helps in that what it, uh, the blue bar shows you the storage level uh, as of October 25th. The yellow bar shows what the capacity is for each of these. And here's Shasta, look at that. Shasta has, has uh, 4, 4,532,000 uh, acre feet. And here's, here's Lake Oroville. And you can see the red line is the historical average. And the blue line is in fact the water level as of October 26th. Now I'm not gonna talk about the drought at this point because I'll get, I'm gonna talk about it a little later, but basically this map is updated weekly so that we really have a pretty good handle on where the water is and how much do we have, okay? Now let's talk about where else does we get, do we get our water? And that's the Colorado River Basin. Most people don't stop, they don't, they don't really think much about this. You know, they just they turn on the tap and you get water. And they don't really stop to think about where did it come from? <clears throat> well, the Colorado River Basin, okay, supplies that, 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 that just a second, let me get my notes here. Yeah, the Colorado River Basin is the backbone, is, as, is actually the backbone for our imported water supply. 25% of our water comes from this basin. And it, you know, the Colorado River, it's about, you know, it's 1,400 miles long. It goes all the way down, it ends, it ends at the Gulf of California. So it's flowing through, there are seven states, the, the, you got the upper basin up in here, and you got the lower basin down in this area. All everybody in these areas basically need the water, and we're talking about supplying water. You know, to uh, I think it's almost like forty million people. That's how many people rely on the water from this basis. Another interesting fact of this is you look right here, see this, where it's the, these areas that are, that are with the red lines. Those are areas <clears throat> that are adjacent and they receive Colorado River water. There was a lawsuit oh, about 30, 40 years ago in Colorado when people on this side, of, on the upper side, on the western slope of the Rockies discovered that the people on the eastern slope were taking water from their side and putting it over and taking it to the eastern side. And they had a lawsuit and said, hey, you, you can't take any more of our water because a lot of the farmers in this area were having difficulty. They had a dry area. So that this whole basis 
Now this Colorado River thing is really quite interesting and it's really the backbone of the river because it maintains <clears throat> the people, the farms, businesses, tribal nations and the wild and the wildlife throughout all these seven different states. And it, you know, and it, and and it, and as the river starts up in this area, and you got Lake Powell here, the water right here from Lake Powell, that goes into Utah, and is and and the electricity generated there, and then some of it comes off down and comes down into Arizona and then over into New Mexico. Right here is 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 basically where you have Lake Mead, and you come down down here to you got this dam, you got Lake Havasaw here. And then you've got right here, you got Porter Dam or uh, uh, Parker Dam, which is where we pump our, you know, the, from the basin. That's where we get into the California Aqueduct, which is the next slide. So the Colorado River Aqueduct, which is our supply, and it's, all, it's built in the 30s, uh, it really is an engineering marvel in that. <clears throat> It you know that that uh, it 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 carries the water from that from as an engineering and because it's conveyed, this water is conveyed 242 miles through tunnels, siphons, and it's 25 percent of the water we use in Southern California, and it has its own power generation. Parker, the Parker power plant there produces 30,000 uh, kilowatts of energy. 50% of it is used to drive, to drive all the, 50% of it is used to drive all of the pumps in order to move that water from the Colorado River to Southern California. So you're talking 15,000 kilowatts of power just to move the water so that we have a, 25% of our water supply. And, you know, so it, it demonstrates the complexity that we have here. Now, the Colorado River, the complexity also with the Colorado River is because it serves so many people, it's, it's really kind of negotiated. It's a, it, it, the water itself is controlled by what they call the law of the river. And there are separate agencies, California, Nevada, uh, Utah, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado all get, you know, with the federal government, because the federal government controls the dams and the reservoirs there. And so it's a continual negotiation of who's going to have how much water. And right now, one of the big negotiating items is because I, I participate with the with the Colorado Basin uh, Water District up there that is concerned about their irrigation and everything. And, and there's uh, discussions going how much water to release from from, uh, you know, from the dam uh, Lake Powell down to Lake Mead, because Lake Mead water level tends to be lower and it's, it's getting too warm for the fish. So one of the real conversations going is how much water do we le release from Lake Powell to Lake Mead? It shows you the complexity in managing the flow. All this water, both from the California aqueduct and from the uh, Colorado aqueduct comes to the Deemer plant. This is located in Yorba Linda, okay? It's been it's been expanded. I mean, it's 520 million gallons per day processing of the water, and and that is our source of the water. And actually, it's at that plant where salinity, the control of salinity, is is managed. Because one of the problems with the water coming from 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 Colorado is it's, it has high salt content, much higher salt content than we would normally, that we get from Northern California. It's the nature of the soil and everything as the water moves. So this is where we, where we control that. And, and, and this is 
this is carried from the plant. Here's the, here's the, here's the Deemer plant right here. And you can see where the water is brought because the water from the Colorado uh, aqueduct comes into Lake Paris. And then this line here carries it to the Deemer plant. And then you got this line coming over and coming down right here is coming down is the water from the north from California aqueduct to the Deemer plant. At that point, then we got most our water now currently comes from the Allen McCullough pipeline. Comes right down here. And remember that reservoir I told you, R6 reservoir? This is it right here. If you can see my, if you can see my arrow, that is the point where we take the water coming down from this treatment plant. That comes in at this point, and then that's what we use then to feed into our basic system. Now, as a point, since we're looking at this, one of the things that we're going to be doing, we're looking at as an agency, you see this major pipeline here, which is a, which is kind of the east and it's called the, it's this one right down here is the joint transmission, a joint uh, transmission line going down to South County. This runs right through our district. Right now, we don't tap into that. And so one of our major, one of our investment projects is about fifteen million dollars to type into the, to put a position there where we can type into it. The water pressures are different, so we have to put a pump station there where we can. And if you're familiar, there's a, a reservoir right there by the Ayers Hotel. We're looking at possibly putting a little small pump station here, so we can type in, we can tap into here pull water from here, put it in our reservoir. And so that gives us more reliability because right now we're relying on this one line here. Plus we're relying on this green line from the, from the Baker plant. So you can see the this shows you the complexity of moving the water through all of Orange County. And these are major pipelines. I mean, these things are like 60 inches in diameter. I mean, they're moving a lot of water. So that, that kind of ties and gives you an idea of how the water is, is distributed to us, okay? And, 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 and the major investments that it takes to make this happen. Now let's see, what is our water supply? We talked about what we have. See, 43% of our water comes from the Metropolitan Water District. 40%, 39% from the Baker Treatment Plant which was, uh, if I go back a slide, that was the plant that is located. It, we're part owner with Irvine and it's located right in this area right here. That's a new plant, it's not showing on this map, but it's a new plant right here. So that, uh, and we, when that plant was built about three years ago, we invested in it. So that, that gives us additional source, at least, you know, trying to have multiple sources of water which is so critical as we go forward. And then 17% of our water supply is actually the recycled water. Prior to our putting in that plant, okay, we had to buy 100, we had 100% 100 of our water requirements were fulfilled by potable water, either from MODOC or the Metropolitan Water District and, 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 and before the Baker plant, it was all coming from the Metropolitan Water District. What I want to do now, let's now let's get into the issue of ensuring that we have adequate water. And this is, you know, uh, showing the weather conditions of the last five years, and it shows it, it basically is the reason I put this here is to show that we get all our water from November to, to April. If we don't get good rainfall, then we don't have the water. And this is what, what we really, and we'll talk a little bit about the drought that we're in, because this shows you <coughs> the kind of water, water year, look at, look at the water we got here, how dry it was in 2021. You know, I mean, we're 24%. 
Right now, they're projecting that next year we might get up to this level. And what you can see is from November, or here we started, actually, we started already in October because we had that, we, we already had that atmospheric river. Now, talk about atmospheric river. So we got a good start, but we don't know, you know, we need about four or five more of those atmospheric rivers to get us up to this level if we, that would really begin to fill the reservoirs. This was the wettest year we had in 2017. So this gives you an idea of what is happening and where the water, you know, what we, we rely on the water during the winter. And if we don't get it, then we have a drought. And this is, shows you, and, and, and I wanted to show you like Lake Oroville, okay? This is Lake Oroville, as I said, you know, was, was the major, was, was one of the um, major reservoirs. This, this one is as of, shows you what has happened with the last water when we had that big storm. Lake Oroville, we went, we increased our level in Lake Oroville. And if you remember that chart before where I, where I was showing you the California, <coughs> the California aqueduct, and I showed you that picture where Lake Oroville was so empty. Look how much water, and we raised that 34 feet in just that one storm. So we get four or five storms and we can fill Lake Oroville. And that's, you know, to, to get us out of the drought, that's where we need to be. Because you can see the level right here where it was in November uh, in 2019. Look at the levels, the differences. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to take a little drink here if I, if I may, okay? You know, my throat is getting dry. Okay, thank you. And you can see the kind of usage where it went just in, in, in one year, from November 2019, 2020, it dropped 50, almost 50 feet in elevation. And in November, and it was down to before, before the rainfall, you were down, we were down to about uh, 600 and 650 feet. We were already down to almost, uh, well, it was about 630 feet. And so we gained 34 feet just in one storm. And I think that's an important aspect. Let's look at Lake Mead. Yeah, 25% of our water comes from this area. And you can see the, the levels of what has changed in, at Lake Mead. And this is, you know, this is what is so scary uh, in that it's down here now. One of the things that I mentioned earlier when I talked about the Colorado River Basin, the discussions that go on with the federal government of releasing, because Lake Mead is fed by Lake Powell. And so they can raise the level of Lake Mead by releasing more water from Lake Powell. And, and so it becomes a balancing act. How much water should we be storing up in Lake Powell versus how much water in Lake Mead? And one of the things that's driving the level of water in Lake Mead is in fact, this low level is the water is gotten, is, is, is the temperature of the water is becoming too warm for the fish. And so they're talking about if they're, you know, in order to make sure that the, that the wildlife and the fish survive, they need to get the temperature of the water up. And to do that, they're going to have to put more water into Lake Mead. It is, I, I find all this really fascinating. I hope you do, because it is such a critical issue for our survival and how this is managed. The next slide is one that we track uh, every month. And this is basically the Lake Mead and shows the historical and the projected levels of water. And one of the things to notice, look historically going back to 2002, look, look at the level of Lake Mead back in those days, 1170 feet, you know? And now we're down, we're talking, you know, extra 30 feet. We're talking, uh, you know, almost 100 between the shortage trigger level, that's almost a hundred feet difference in elevation. If you go look at Lake Mead, you go now look at Lake Mead, 
and you can see it looks like a bathtub ring around it. I don't know if you know how many of you have traveled up there and have looked at it. And this is the reason. This is this is where the water level has become. An interesting part of this is that historically, the Metropolitan Water District, when we we have had sufficient water coming from Northern California, we didn't take all our draw. So that we used Lake Mead as a storage force, as a reservoir for the future. That's why on this chart, see, our shortage level, okay, is 30 feet lower than the shortage level trigger for Arizona, Nevada, and the other states, because that difference is the amount that, that the Metropolitan Water District has stored in Lake Mead for our future. And, and so this, this water management has been really very, very critical. And I personally believe that uh, the Metropolitan Water District has done quite a good job in really forecasting and thinking ahead and, and, and to ensure that we have adequate supplies. And I, I'm always quite impressed when I, when I think through that. Now let's talk about what happens with the draw. And let's talk about atmospheric rivers. It, atmospheric rivers were something I hadn't really heard of uh, even before the term. About four or five years ago, I was at a, at a lecture and, uh, and, a, and an engineer uh, from the from JPL, uh, you know the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where they do a lot of work with uh, with NASA. They do a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, do a lot of research just on atmospheric conditions and monitoring the atmosphere. And a lot of their satellites are doing that. Well, atmospheric rivers, I hadn't realized the the term was developed uh, out of Yale University, atmospheric scientists there. And they, they were talking about how the storm systems, they classified them as, as uh, you know, that when they move across the country in the Midwest, you have them. And, and these are like rivers that are moving with the water. And so the atmospheric river here, the one we just recently had, you know, a couple was about two or three weeks ago. It was an exceptional, it was, it was rated as a five out of five. And here, this chart here, shows how the ratings go. And this is basically the amount of water uh, per, per meter per second, okay? And at the, the rate at which the water is falling. And you can see how they've classified this now. And this is an atmospheric picture of what does an atmospheric river look like? Well, take a look at this map. When that came through, it shows you how in that seven day period, the amount of water that it was deposited here in Northern California. And this, and you'll see down here in Fresno, this area, we didn't get, we got very little rain or very, you know, very little, but boy, it really hit in this Northern area, causing, as you saw pictures, you know, causing a lot of floods. And when you look at this map, this shows you the difference of what happened with that atmospheric river. Here's October 5th. And look at, this was the drought conditions. Look how bad, I mean, it, you know, we had exceptional drought in all this dark area is section. Look at all the red here, you know, that which is basically extreme drought. Now we're, we're better down here. We didn't really, you know, we don't have, we haven't had a severe drought. And, and so we're in a moderate drought situation. But look what happened after that. Here's November 2nd, after that massive rainfall. Notice the difference. This whole area right here removed from, from uh, exceptional drought to now extreme. And you can see just one atmospheric river, what change it made and how quickly we can change the situation, but we don't control the weather. We don't control the atmosphere, but we sure rely on it and we sure have to monitor it. And it just that that one event was enormous. So let's take a look now, and let's look at as of October 26 now, and you take a look and, and see, and Orville filled up a little bit more. 
and so did uh, so did Shasta. So they, you know, so Lake Oroville now is at 27% of its capacity, 53% of normal. That's a pretty, that was a pretty big change from where we were. One rain event. And, and so it shows you that because of all the reservoirs we have, if we get the rain or we get the snow, we can capture it and it's available for us, you know? But these are the, these are uh, these reservoirs. Some of them are state reservoirs, and others are federal reservoirs. They're still at critical low levels. But what we need to do is pray for some some heavy storms this winter, and that will help us immensely. Okay. So I think this gives you a feel for what it takes and how we get it here. Now let's take a look at what our situation here with met. We get every, you know, they're monitoring this on a continuing basis. And this is their forecast for, for this year, estimated water storage. And, you know, and right now, as we've talked, you know, we're only getting 5% of, of, of normal of our state water project right here. And these two areas shows you when, see, when, if we don't get it from the state, then we have to get it from Colorado, or we have to draw it from what we have saved. And look at the amount of that MET has managed to put into storage. You know, this is 3.1 million acre feet. And we came into the year with 3.2 million acre feet because we had built, MET built uh, you know, a, a large reservoir out in, river, in the Riverside area, that uh, Diamond Lake Reservoir, and had, which allowed us then to store water ahead for our, for, for, you know, for our needs. This is our normal, this dotted line here is our normal water usage level. That's what we normally require. You can see that we have some backup, but this year we're gonna use 617,000 acre feet of water from our storage. If we don't get adequate rain, because right now, at this rate, with what we have in our aquifers and everything, you know, we will be using at the rate of probably seven to eight hundred, maybe a million acre feet a year. I would hope that with conservation, we can keep it at six hundred thousand or thereabout. But you can see that only gives us four years of storage to get down to this level. So this is where our concern is, and that's why you see that you know, that what has happened, and, and, and there's been a recent announcement that uh, to go into, uh, you know, to conserve, start conserving water and cut, cut water usage, if you can, to reduce about 15%. And part, part of it is <coughs> sound planning, making wise investments. What you know, we've invested uh, in, in Southern California, we've invested billions of dollars both in recycling, in, 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 in storage, and, 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 with the, and with the money that we have done just here in Orange County, we got one of the largest uh, uh, recycling plant for direct potable use in the, in, in, in the world. Where, and, and, and with its investment right now, is gonna be up to 150 million gallons a day. Now that is plowed back into the, as I explained and mentioned earlier, into the aquifer under, uh, under Orange County. And you know, so it's going to be these kinds of investments that are going to help, and then just water smart behaviors. And one of the things that we're that we'll be doing going forward is when we make, and this is where everybody can help, is that make sure you if you see any leaks. Make sure they get fixed. And we need to save water by, by shorter showers. Be, be wise in our use of water, you know, scraping food off of plates, run the dishwashers when they're full. We, you know, we, we allocate in our pricing roughly uh, 50, 50 gallons per day per person is what we allocate for, per, for a household. And we basically figure most households in our, a lot of our single family households 
uh, you know, our, get to roughly, we figure about 200 gallons a day. In the village, we figure about 75 gallons a day because we tend to, you know, our, our, our population is such that, I mean, we got 17,000 people in 12,000 manors. So, so that's about one and a half people per, per unit. So that's how we, how we budget relative to the, to the village. And, and, and using, you know, if, if you see overspray, you know, let's use it wisely, making sure that, uh, you know, and I know that the village, they have nearly eight, eight or 10 people in landscaping doing nothing but monitoring and working with the, with the irrigation lines to making sure that we're conservative and use the water. And then, you know, for, for individuals to take advantage of the available rebates, okay, and that's, you know, and, and we run classes, free classes on, 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 on basically on vegetation, on, on landscaping, uh, saving water on landscaping. And one final action that I think to just to, to talk about the future, what do we do in the future? Because as we have more people, one of the things that, that we are looking and working on and, 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 and the government is, is, there's a lot of research going on for this. And I talked about direct potable reuse that we already do uh, in, uh, you know, with the Orange County Water District. In South County, because we all import water, we're looking at and, 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 and talking about investments that we might need to make in some of our, in our for direct potable reuse from our recycling plants ourselves. The challenge we have is the, the laws currently don't allow, even though the water itself is very pure and drinkable, the laws are such that we can't take it and put it directly back into the water lines. It has to be put into a, into a natural uh, filter, which is the aquifer. There are people, uh, the, uh, the, the government is working, uh, the scientists are working to try to establish legislation that would help us. Because at that point, right now, see, we, we release, even from our, uh, from our recycling plant, uh, you know, uh, several million gallons a day to the ocean. That's water, if we could further refine it and use it, we, and use it as potable water, we could put it right back into our system, and then we'd have a full recyclable system. And that's the ultimate for all of us uh, in, you know, for the world, really, is there's a limited amount of water. And, you know, the earth doesn't have, it doesn't create any more water. It's either salt water or it's fresh water. And, 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 and so, we have to really use technology, and that should be our future of the, using technology to get us to the point where we, that the use of water, it's, it's a continual use, and we can continually recycle and minimize then those losses and not worry about then putting any water into the ocean. So, um, so the key, the key element here then, over here you'll see basically this is our demonstration garden on, uh, on, on, on different plants and how, and, and the different plants you can use and the amount of water that's going to be required for them. I talked about the rebate program. We have a, a, our board meetings information is on the website right here. At the, uh, eltorowaterdistrict.com. And we have a community advisory group meetings. We have those quarterly, although with, uh, with COVID, uh, we, we haven't had one now in over a year. We're anticipating having an advisory group meeting, which is shown right here, where people have come in. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and this is Lynn. These are board members right here, I recognize. And it's open to all the citizens in our in our district and <clears throat> we're sending out uh in, invitations for people to sign up and once we have them back in here then we we give you lunch we have lunch available and then we'll have a presentation and we talk about 
the status. We talk about budgets. We talk about all the activities that we're doing. And then we also run free online landscaping classes. Okay. So are there any questions? Okay, that was wonderful, uh, Catherine. Your slides are to die for. They're just superb. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you now to end your share screen. Uh, and we have a little bit of time, and I do have a couple of questions. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's good. Um, so um, you say that uh, we... Uh, even though we are, you show very convincingly, we are in Orange County much better off uh, than a lot of others, uh, other counties and other places. Um, but you also recommend that we reduce our consumption by 15%. Yeah. So my question or comment or whatever, as a resident of Laguna Woods, um, runs something like this. All right, I have two, two issues. We'll see how much time we have. Um, certainly one way to cut that, cut that down is for uh, homes, households to reduce consumption. Uh, and it seems to me, uh, as someone who's given this some thought, that there are, there are two ways uh, to motivate people uh, to cut back. Uh, mm -hmm. One is uh, what some call the free market approach, and that's to charge them more. Um, and the other uh, is uh, to punish them. Um, my son lives in Santa Cruz, uh, where they have a very strict if you uh, uh, accounting, and if you uh, if you use more than your allocation, and your price goes up uh, very fast. Now the problem here, as I certainly don't have to tell an expert like you, is that in Laguna Woods we do not have water meters. Uh, and at an event I heard not too long ago, uh, uh, which our board was talking a bit about water, I believe they stated that our water consumption, as they had been, because uh, uh, someone is counting it, but we don't have water meters at our house, had actually increased uh, in 2021, rel relative to the same period in 2020. So, so even though we should be cutting back, we're spending, uh, we, we're consuming more, uh, but we have neither uh, price controls uh, nor, uh, you know, any kind of restrictions that would repeat any penalties. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on that or whether you feel that uh, we uh, should go one way or the other. It does not look like we're making a lot of progress right now. Well, I, I agree with you in that regard. <clears throat> and, and, and one of the challenges, we do have a tiered pricing. Okay, uh, the pricing structure. Now you don't see it. People outside the village do. Right, <laughs> exactly. It is there. In fact, we have, where we have individual meters, for example, gate 11. Mm -hmm. Gate 11 has individual meters. We know in some, in some houses there, where they're in a, in, 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 a, in a tier four. We, in fact, monitor, we have set up four different tiers. You get up to tier four, you're talking about uh, $7 per 100 gallons. And, you know, where the normal cost is, is, is basically uh, $2. So we do have extra charges. Unfortunately, the law, Davis Sterling, doesn't allow us to charge separate rates for a utility when it's not for everybody. You can't, you can't charge some people for use of water because you happen to have it metered and other people not. And so we're limited in that regard. Admittedly, I know that the boards pay attention. For example, in, in an LH21 or in a garden villa, where the, you know where you got 21 units or 24 units, they they have a separate meter, so we know how much water is being used at that building. I know where I live right now. Um, we got a meter, and there's 18 of us on that meter. Okay, I mean it's two two of two units. I live in a in a in a Casa Milano, and there's six units, so we got two Casa Milanos and uh, and two uh, uh, two duplexes. And that's what on, on one meter. Now, it'd be very costly 
to go through and try to individually meter everything. In fact, the buildings are not designed for it. How do you how do you individually meter each unit, you know, in a 20 in, in, in a garden villa? The plumbing was never designed for that. That's and that's a that is a problem. I agree with you. We do have the tiered pricing. We do try to discourage people from using too much water, you know. And you know, and the real key is just for people to maybe pay a little bit more attention. And so overall, and make sure we don't have leaks. Now I know when I was still on the board, uh, you know, and on third mutual, Dick Palmer for a while, he would go out with a stethoscope in the middle of the night and and go to the three-story buildings and listen to see if any water was flowing and then try to figure out which unit might have a leaky toilet, okay? Because right. a leaky toilet is a big use of water. And so, and that's why I remember we've always had the blue pill program, you know, remember we always used to, and, that, and we still do, we offer the green, the, 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 the blue tablet to people and oftentimes through the administration building right there at the lobby. And you put that, put that blue pill into your tank and if you have, if, if, if you end up with the water in your, you know, in the toilet within say a few minutes after that thing is dissolved, if you've got blue water now in the toilet, then you've got a leaky flipper. And that's, and, and that then, because what happens then is that leaks the water out, then it automatically refills and it just keeps recycling. So this is where the residents themselves can help us and and if they have a and and if they have a faucet that's not turning off then they really need to they they need to uh, you know to call resident services and have and, and and have a plumber come or or call their own private plumber and 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 change out uh, the faucets or change the ring and, you know many years ago I used to do it myself I don't do it anymore but you know, put the put a new gasket in there that seals the the, the faucet. Uh, you know, at the, the at the seal. So okay, well, I'm afraid we're we're about out of time. But, uh, but and, and I know that the you know the village has done a lot in Third Mutual and even in United, changing the the washing machines so that they're not top loaders to front loaders because they use considerably less water. So these are the issues, and we have rebate programs to encourage people to do that. So any resident that has their own uh, washing, you know, washer and dryer, most people have probably put in front loader, but if they still have a top loader, okay, then I would suggest they really consider uh, changing it. Concerned citizens, thanks, Catherine Freshly, for helping us understand the sources of our water, the adequacy of our water supply, and the current expectations regarding our future water supply. If you can cut back, her message is, please do so. Right. And concerned citizens, thanks our audience for watching this broadcast. We hope you will tune in for another informative program next time.